coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, today we talk about herbs because I have time on my hands. A bad pun right off the bat. T H Y M E, but as Stacy reminds me, if you have to spell it out, it's not that great a pun. So let's move on. You have sunshine, you have containers, they're easy to grow, and one of the trends in gardening is all things Mediterranean. So, Stacy, as we enter the heat of summer, why not herbs? Oh, why not indeed? I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the luxuries of gardening, the luxury of having your own cut flowers out your back door. The luxury of having your own herbs out your back door is something I really can't put into words, you know. You're sitting there thinking about what you're going to have for dinner, and then you say, well, shoot, I don't have any cilantro. And then you say, wait, yes, I do. It's in the garden. (laughs) And that is such a great feeling. I love growing herbs. I grow a ton of herbs. And so, yeah, you don't have to twist my arm. Well, for all gardeners, because herbs tend to be easy to grow, uh, Stacey, I would dare venture out and say that they're, to a degree, pest-free, too, just by their nature. They really are, and I'm proud to say that deer don't eat them. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, how much luckier can you be? The tomatoes, forget it. Peppers, eh, they'll nibble them. The herbs, they never touch them, and I am so grateful for that. But, you know, interestingly, I was actually just thinking, uh, over the week, last weekend, I was planting pesto perpetuo basil. You know that one? you bet. It is such an amazing basil. So it's variegated, which is cool and different. Um, but it doesn't flower. It never flowers. So you can keep getting that foliage. It doesn't get woody and really, really resinous. Instead or of the like plant that. putting all its energy into flowers yeah. at some point. Yeah. So it's beautiful. It's fragrant. And uh, for many years, I had a problem with uh, the uh, Asiatic garden beetle on okay. my basil. You know that? I also call it the coppery menace. Uh-huh. It was the only thing that would eat basil, and it would absolutely skeletonize it. Now, that problem has abated for me a bit, knock on wood, but I always found that they never touched my pesto perpetuo. But that really is like the only herb pest I have ever had to contend with in many, many years of herb gardening. Well, there's pesto besto and a basil basil, Italian sweet basil, a number of varieties, as Stacy said, that uh, really don't do much as far as flower initiation is concerned and so you get more benefit from the plant i call it basil instinct and i love to plant basil around my tomatoes because it makes the tomatoes taste better no scientific evidence but there you have it i love thyme also stacy and a favorite of mine is woolly thyme and i grow it for its ornamental nature not its herb nature yeah woolly thyme does not sound terribly appetizing right <laughs> <laughs> but it is a beautiful plant um i grow a lot of thyme and would would you believe that thyme self sows abundantly for me in my garden i mean it pops up everywhere and that's really nice so wherever the parent plant is when that's getting a little old i'm sure to find some seedlings around that are just getting into the prime of their life and really productive that's great i'd like to know if you grow some lemongrass lemongrass is a great herb First of all, for the botanical name, I'm going to clobber this, Stacy. but Symbopogon, 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 forget it. Yeah. It's called lemongrass. <laughs> ah, and uh, lemongrass uh, has this great botanical name, but the great thing about it, growing it in your yard or garden, is if you walk by and you take some of it up and stick it in your mouth, it tastes like the breakfast cereal Fruit Loops. <laughs> okay, that's it. Does I find that lemongrass is a very polarizing flavor, but uh, that is a very enthusiastic endorsement. Yeah, used in Asian and Thai yeah. cooking. I don't eat Fruit Loops for breakfast. <laughs> I'm more of a Captain Crunch guy, but that's okay. <laughs> How about dill? Do you like growing dill? I remember as a kid working on the farm growing dill, and it was always covered. Uh, with bees. Yep. It's so pretty. I do love growing dill, although dill is one of those plants that uh, never really stays where you put it. And I think the best way to grow dill is to grow, start it from seed. So, you know, it's really hard to grow from a seedling. I Not hard, but it's much easier to grow from a seed and let some of those flowers go to seed and then let the dill tell you where it wants to grow. I love having a nice population of self-sowing dill. That's a great point. I like that point. And to have that dill so we can make some dilly beans later on in the year. Fantastic. I had read somewhere that dill was called the meeting house herb, Mm. was chewed by early American children to lull them through the long sermons. Oh, 
My parents also, <laughs> you, my parents used to always pass me peppermints so I could get through those eternal sermons about eternity. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Mm. And, and if the peppermint came out of my dad's pocket, it tasted like cologne. And if it came out of my mom's pocket, it tasted like perfume. But I'll never forget that. <laughs> well, I don't know if that will, will fly these days. I think today's children demand a little more than a had a Dell to non I agree. <laughs> in boring situations. <laughs> All right, let's get divisive. Let's get uh, old controversial and talk cilantro. Oh yes, cilantro is so controversial because people either love it or or can't stand uh, the taste. And as I understand it, Stacy, it's uh, biological. In other words, there was a genetic survey by researchers at Cornell University. They found that there's a very specific gene that makes some people strongly dislike the taste of cilantro, saying it tastes like soap. I have heard that. I am firmly in the love it camp. I've Me pretty too. much always got to have a bunch love of it in it. my fridge because I use it in so, so many recipes. But I think what's uh, more controversial about cilantro when it comes to gardening is so many people don't understand how to grow it. Yeah. I have heard from so, so many gardeners over the years who just say, every time I grow cilantro, it doesn't look good. It doesn't thrive. Like, what am I doing wrong? And I am going to reveal the secret Aha. right here on the Gardening Simplified show. Okay. The grocery store has given you unrealistic cilantro expectations. Mm. So, you know, you buy cilantro in the grocery store, you get this big, leafy, beautiful bunch. That big, leafy, beautiful bunch that you're buying is probably 10 to 15 cilantro plants. Maybe less, maybe 8 to 10. But it's not one plant. And so people, I think because that's what their experience buying it is, um, they tend to think it's something that you're just going to grow and grow and grow like basil or thyme and just keep trimming off of. But that is not the case at all with cilantro. It naturally has an extremely short life cycle. That's so true. We go, like last week we were talking about annuals. Yep. So it's a true annual, but that lifespan is a matter of weeks mm -hmm. instead of a matter of months. And so you can't just plant cilantro once and expect it to produce for you all season long. It just won't happen. Books will talk about cilantro bolting or going to flower, at which point it, it, even the most diehard cilantro fan, I think, could barely stand to eat it because it develops some kind. Have you ever eaten a bolted cilantro? Oh, yeah. It's a, woof, yeah. that's a taste sensation there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> talk about divisive. But you keep seeding it, right? Yes, you I mean, keep just keep seeding, seeding it. it. That's it. So definitely this cilantro is another plant that I would say don't buy the seedlings at the garden center. Instead, buy a pack of seed and keep sowing it like every two weeks or something. Now, what I often do is to uh, actually put it into two terracotta pots. So I have one kind of on the back burner growing in and one that I'm cutting off of. Okay. So in my displays, I don't have one that's all, you know, stubble. Um, but yeah, cilantro is not going to be like you see in the grocery store. You need to sow a lot of it and you need to sow it often. And then you will have the cilantro of your dreams. But you have to stop thinking about cilantro like you think about basil. You know, if you get good at growing cilantro and you give it away to friends and neighbors, you know what that makes you? Oh, no. A cilantropist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving along, I love uh, clipping chives in the garden. I love growing chives. It's easy. It's fun. And I love snipping up little chunks of chives and putting them on my potatoes. Chives are so useful mm -hmm. to have in the garden. I got a secret for chives, too. You do? Yeah. You know. So, you know, after they flower, which is right now, and chive flowers are so beautiful and edible... But once they flower, they kind of get real thin and yeah. you don't get a lot of like robust chives anymore. Well, all you have to do after they flower is cut the whole thing back to a little stubble mound. I have found that. Keep it watered and then you'll get a whole new crop of fresh chives. And if they do flower, the flowers are, uh, are beautiful. They're beautiful. So. They're edible. They attract pollinators. Um, I love them. It's, uh, it's a great uh, herb. Everyone should have that. Uh, in their garden. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a, a famous song uh, done by the Bee Gees, Chive Talking. Remember that one? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you know, we could talk about mint. I love lemon balm in tea. Uh, chamomile, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. I chamomile? Uh -huh. Yeah, love that. Uh, but you talk about mint and how invasive it can be. Probably uh, mint is a good example of why, in many cases, we grow herbs in pots, right? Yes, but mint resents being in a pot. I'll tell you how I control my mint. Okay. Dry soil. If the soil is very dry, it will not spread. 
as vigorously as if it's in a moist soil. So I keep my soil real dry, which is not difficult when you live in West Michigan near the lakeshore, very sandy. And that really helps to eliminate the spread. So it stays in a nice kind of contained area and I don't have to worry about terrorizing my neighborhood with my mint patch. Fantastic. Fantastic. It was meant to be. All right. So we could talk for days about herbs. I think for future shows, we should uh, continue to dive into this subject. Well, I, I, I believe that you really do want to talk about herbs, but I also think you have a whole list of herb uh, puns that you have not been able to pull out yet. So <laughs> I, I'm questioning your motives, Rick. There's a reason I love the music of Elvis Parsley. All right. So coming up next, Plants on Trial will continue, well, kind of an herbaceous or herb talk, not herbaceous, but an herb talk uh, with a beautiful plant that Stacy's going to introduce to us. That's all coming up here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Man, we really didn't get enough time to talk about herbs. We'll have to have a part two. Let's do it. I mean, we got to talk rosemary and a whole bunch of other herbs. Yep, and there's always more to talk about with herbs. Now, I did want to clarify, I did say mint doesn't do great in containers, and I did want to just kind of offer a bit more explanation on mm -hmm. that. Uh, it will. You can certainly grow it in a container, but because it does like to run... It doesn't really like to be contained, so it doesn't. It's not really as uh, robust in the long term. Well, I agree, and I knew exactly where you were going with that, and I agree with you. I mean, it is a plant that can require. It grows so fast; it requires a new zip code by the end of summer. It does. So go ahead and try it. I never want to discourage anyone from trying it, but be aware that. Yeah. You know, a lot of things where you think, okay, this is the solution. I'm going to contain it and I'm going to fix the problem. The plant's like, nah, -uh, got other ideas. So <laughs> just a little FYI there. Uh, so uh, today's plant on trial is uh, we don't really have herbs exactly in the Proven Winners Color Choice line. So I had to stretch it a little bit, but I sure. think I did a pretty okay job. Today's plant on trial is black lace elderberry. I think you did a great job. I love elderberry. Elderberry is so cool. And, you know, black lace is an ornamental elderberry that um, is, uh, instead of just having like plain green foliage and white flowers, it has deep, almost black foliage, kind of purple black foliage that is naturally occurring in this beautiful, fine, lacy kind of dissected look. Oh, that lacy dissected look to the foliage. Stacy, when when I see the plant from a distance, it looks like a Japanese maple. Tree. And, you know, that's it's a great opportunity for people who live in climates that are too cold for Japanese maple mm -hmm. to kind of have that look. Now, it doesn't have the full color of Japanese maple, and it does get much, much larger than most Japanese maples. But it does have that similar, that, that finely dissected foliage that people love in, in Japanese maples. It does have a similar look. And then right around now in early summer, it develops flowers and the flowers are pink. So you have this dark purpley black foliage with these bright pink flowers. Uh, black lace is one of those plants that when people see it in bloom at the garden center, they just have to have it. Wow. Yes. I've seen so many garden centers position black lace as an impulse item, you know, like at the entrance because they know people don't always make it out to the shrub section, which you should. There's lots of good stuff back there, but uh, they just know when you see this thing, you've got to have it. Now, where does the herb part come along? Uh, people are probably wondering. Some people have some sense that elderberries are edible, have an herbal, uh, you know, connection. Um, and I think a lot of this just comes from being in the U.S. where elderberries are not as popular for food or medicine as they are abroad. So in uh, Scandinavia, did you know that they will cut off the fresh flowers of elderberries? So they have to be fresh because when the flowers get old, they smell like cat pee. When they're fresh, they smell like anise. Elderberry has a lot of weird That's smell. That's appetizing. I know. Elderberry has a lot of weird smell stuff going on, as anyone <laughs> who has ever grown one can tell you. But when the flowers are freshly open, they have a really beautiful kind of light, sweet anise scent. So in Scandinavia, they cut them off. They dip them in batter and deep fry them as a kind of fritter. I've never tried it, but I've seen pictures of it. And um, they're infused into beverages. So especially in Eastern Europe, they're placed in like ice water or lemonade where they infuse that, uh, you know, kind of anise scent. Uh, in England, they're very popular, are made into an elderflower fizz where the flowers are so high in natural yeast that with some sugar and some uh, pure water that doesn't have any minerals or chlorine in it, they will ferment into a lightly alcoholic, naturally fermented beverage. Wow, I'd like to try that. You know, it's true that Sambucus or elderberry 
uh, has been around for a long, long time and has been used by many cultures uh, for its medicinal purposes too, right? Yeah, and I think if people do have some sense of elderberry having medicinal qualities, it is because its uh, use in cold medicine has really become popular, especially since COVID. Um, it can alleviate uh, cold and flu symptoms, especially cough. I think there's even a cough medicine called Sambucol, which is named for Sambucus, the botanical name of elderberry, but the fruits uh, most commonly are used to make things like cough syrups and other uh, uh, herbal remedies like that. And wine. And wine. Oh, yeah. Every time I see the plant, I think in school, I was in a play called Arsenic and Old Lace. Oh, yeah. Frank Capra. Uh, uh, Cary Grant starred in it, but I was the crazy guy who thought he was Teddy Roosevelt. When the aunties would lace the elderberry wine with poison, I'd collect the bodies thinking they were affected by yellow fever, bring them to the basement, and not, just to play, not for real. <laughs> Rick wouldn't be sitting here next to me. If Arsenic and real. old lace, look it up. <laughs> it's a classic. I mean, yeah. it's a real classic. Uh, but yeah, elder, it can be made into wine. I've often seen it used as sauces, like for game and that kind of thing. Uh, but interestingly, as we sit here and talk about the culinary and medicinal uses of elderberry, the foliage and stems are very toxic. Yeah. So if you are going to consume elderberry, you will do so at your own risk. And black lace would not be one of those varieties that I would recommend for consumption. It really is sold as an ornamental. And uh, it was a reject from a, an edible or elderberry breeding program. Wow. Yes. So, so this uh, was happening in the UK where, like I said, their elderberries are much more a part of, you know, food and medicine right. than they are here typically. And they had this breeding program where they were trying to find elderberries for food and me medicinal uses. And black lace came out of one of their, you know, crosses and they said, whoa, 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 this is way too ornamental for us. Uh, it's still got some of these qualities, but what it really has is better in a program like Proof and Winners Color Choice Shrub. So they shipped it across the pond and it has been one of our best sellers ever since it was first introduced because really I think People sort of had a sense that we do have a native elderberry. We actually have two native elderberries in the U.S., uh, in Canada. Um, but no one ever really thought of them as particularly ornamental right. until black lace came along. And then it was like, whoa, really, you know, raising the bar. Beautiful. So um, it's a very easy plant to grow. And I so let me just back up a sec. So talking about the native elderberries, our native elderberry is Sambucus canadensis, which makes sense, Canada, North America. And the, the species that black lace is, is a closely related European cousin, Sambucus nigra. Okay. So some taxonomists will consider one to be a subspecies of the other, indicating that they're even more related. This goes back to the splitters and lumpers, which I think we've talked about on the show before. The splitters and lumpers. If you're a splitter, you, you think firmly that they are two different species, Sambucus canadensis over in North America, Sambucus nigra in Europe. And some will say, oh, it's Sambucus nigra subspecies canadensis. Some people will say it's Sambucus canadensis subspecies nigra. It goes on and on. I'm sure uh, people are going to need some dill to chew on as I go through the botanical. <laughs> Can I have a peppermint? <laughs> as I go through the botanical nomenclature <laughs> of elderberry. Um, but, I, you know, it's important that people sort of understand the difference and similarities between these two. So you can almost think of them as European and American counterparts of one another. They are very similar in their look, in their size, and in their bloom times. And that matters because if you want fruit on black lace elderberry, you're going to need going to a different you. a different variety of a Sambucus or elderberry that blooms at the same time okay. and is not a black lace because all the black lace are clones of each other. So they have identical pollen. You need that cross-pollination of two different varieties okay. in order for fruit to develop. But the great news for those of us in North America who live near natural uh, populations of our native elderberry is those will typically do the trick of pollinating it. Okay. So we probably have some people out there growing black lace right now who said, well, gee, I don't, I didn't know you needed a pollinator, and I get fruit on mine every year. Uh, and that's because our native elderberries are pollinating it because those bloom times do overlap. Um, the other thing that you can do is use our other elderberry, laced up elderberry, which will serve as a pollinator for it, and then you have two black ones. But we'll, we'll get to laced up on another yeah. plant on trial. Oh, that's fantastic. I was doing some reading too, Stacey, and I saw that, 
in some cultures, some areas, they'll use the berries as a food colorant or oh, food coloring. That makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah, the berries are always black. So yeah. whether you have black lace or our native, they on, on Sambucus canadensis, they are a deep purpley black and okay. they, they stain uh, a dark color. Now, very easy to grow. Full sun for most of us. You'll get the best color and most flowering that way. The more your climate is, is hot, the more shade it's going to want. And what you're going to find, this is not a great plant for hot climates. And I know we have a lot of hot climate listeners who are probably groaning right now. And I'm sorry, I'll make it up to you with a good one next week. Um, but uh, in warmer climates, what happens is the foliage doesn't develop the color as well. So it's okay. kind of like a muddy, greeny black. It's not as nice. It can still grow, but we really only recommend it through about USDA zone 7. Okay. Um Average soil needs, average water needs. It's very, very tolerant. I grow a ton of elderberry in my very dry, you know, soil. Does very well. And I wanted to bring up deer because I have found uh, that they will eat it for about the first two years. And after that, they never touch it. So the first two years after planting, I think that the um, growth is just really soft and tender and they're much more attracted to it whereas after a few years in the ground it starts growing beyond their ability to reach it because uh, black lace elderberry is a big plant it's going to get to be about eight to ten feet tall and wide if you don't prune it or just kind of let it grow to its own devices um, so eventually they will stop eating it but I did have to uh, fend off against them for a couple of seasons after I first planted so a little spritz of repellent initially and then we'll be good to go that's right so it is a beautiful plant. If you want to see a picture of it, and I highly recommend that you do, you can visit our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Or like I said, just visit your local garden center. They are sure to have this one and be placing it in a, a position of pride because they know it'll fly out the door when you yeah, see it. I can testify in the garden center. I have a lot of people who come back and say, I can't believe how easy this plant is to grow. Yeah, it's easy, it's beautiful, and uh, again, if you want to know more, GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. We've got to take a little break. When we come back, we're answering your garden questions, so please stay tuned to Gardening Simplified. <music> Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to Gardening Simplified. It's one of my favorite parts of the show where we get to help our listeners be better gardeners, know more about plants in gardening. And, you know, I, I do appreciate our listeners so much. And I, I heard from a listener whose question we answered a few weeks ago. We talked about Josh's birch tree uh, that we, he was saying he had had some trouble with it and he sent some pictures. And so we put out a bunch of thoughts about it. Well, Josh took our advice, not only took our advice, but made a video about taking our advice I love that. on his YouTube channel, Joshua's Garden. Uh, so please, we'll put a link of that, uh, link to that in our show notes. And you're definitely going to want to check that out and see how it's going for Josh. It already looks like it's uh, better than it was when he sent us the pictures, but uh, I'll definitely be following that journey along closely. I think that's great. And Jim sends us a note. He tried his hand at a limb a Rick. And uh, Jim, I think you did pretty good. He said, watching Stacy and Rick after dinner, I'm reformed from a gardening sinner. No more random plant chooser or untested loser. I can now be a true proven winner. Ah, Well done, Jim. And Thanks, thank Jim. you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can certainly do that, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just email help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So what do we got in the mailbag today, Rick? Well, Stacy, Edith has a problem. She sent a photo. My Autumn Joy sedum is having issues. I'm not sure what is causing this to occur. It appears to be spreading to my other sedums within the same area. Leaves distorted, small, curled, something red. I don't see bugs. Have you seen this before? How do I treat it? And thanks for your time. So I looked at Edith's picture, and of course, we'll put these in the show notes so you can see too. And I feel pretty confident that it's slugs. Mm. And, you know, slugs are not a typical problem on sedum right. because, you know, they grow in sunny, dry, Hot, dry areas. Succulents, yes. And uh, slugs do not like those conditions. So, you know, one thing that can happen is that sites can sort of become shadier over time but for whatever reason i do think that that it's slugs you can, when you see those irregular holes um especially kind of in the middle of a leaf that's usually a pretty telltale sign of slugs and i think that um 
you ha- you're seeing a combination of slug damage and the fact that the conditions for your sedum are not ideal for it to grow well. And so those two things are really kind of setting it back. You know, I, I saw your picture of the red bits on the leaves. I think that might be like from too much water or uh, nutrient leaching. It's not really a huge cause for concern. But my advice here, Edith, would be you can control the slugs if you want. And we're going to have a slug control yeah. tip in branching news at the end of the show. Um, but I would consider moving it because I don't think that your uh, autumn joy sedum is in the right place for it to achieve its best. Like I said, sites can change over time, get shadier, get you know wetter from having an irrigation system installed or just being shadier and they don't use as much water. So it's a great point, Stacy. And for people keeping score at home, Autumn Joy Sedum is one of those upright, taller sedums mm-hmm. I have found uh, through the years. Uh, and maybe you don't want to do this. Maybe it's tough for you to do this, but I like to lop mine back initially in June to reduce the size. And then they will still produce those flower heads for the month of August. That might help with the slugs to Mm -hmm. heat things up uh, a little bit, but don't forget to divide them uh, occasionally too, because otherwise you're going to get that floppy thing. Yeah, especially if they're not getting enough sun. They will be very floppy. And, uh, you know, there are some interesting proven winter sedums as well. I really love Pure Joy. Have you grown Pure Joy? It's kind of like a dwarf version of Autumn Joy, so it doesn't get as tall. I think the foliage is really nice, and I have bunches of that that I really, really like. So if you are going to replace it or looking for something for a different sunnier spot in your yard, consider Pure Joy instead. Hey, Maria had a great question for us. Okay. Uh, I was looking for a climbing plant for my new arbor, and I'd love to plant the pink mink clematis. That was our plant on trial a few weeks ago. My only concern is, is it toxic to dogs? I'm not sure that my dog would eat it, but she is a curious dog. Any advice would be appreciated. Now, this is a, obviously, this is a question that we get all the time. People saying, is this toxic? Is that toxic? And, um, you know, short of something being like definitively deathly toxic, it's not an easy question to answer because there really are a number of degrees, you know, to, to this problem. So, you know, the question then becomes, um, well, how toxic is it? Is it like you're just going to feel kind of crummy or your dog's going to feel kind of crummy? Um, will it pass? You know, will they need veterinary attention? How much do they need to consume? As we all know, the dose makes the poison. What parts are toxic? You know, we were just talking about the elderberry and yeah, you know, fresh flowers and ripe fruit can be eaten, but any other part you should not eat. So it becomes, it's really not like a, a black and white kind of question. There's, it's really very gray, but my advice for anybody who wants to make sure they're not planting things that are potentially toxic is really simple. So uh, you're going to use a, a search engine of your choice. You're going to type in the plant's botanical name, which you can get on our website, provenwinnerscolorchoice.com, or it might be on the plant tag, or you can find that somewhere. So use the botanical name, the scientific name, and then type in site, S-I-T-E, colon, dot E-D-U. And what that does is it limits all of your search results to just university websites. So it's going to filter out all the bloggers. That's really good. All the other stuff that you aren't sure that you can rely on. And by limiting it to university websites, you're getting veterinary programs. You're getting medical programs. And so you're getting really useful advice. And then, you know, by making sure that you're using the scientific name, you're also eliminating any confusion about common names because a lot of times people will have the same common name for different things. Um, So that's the surest way, I think, for people to do their own due diligence and then make your own decision based on, you know, hey, your dog might throw up and you say, well, I don't want my dog to throw up, so I'm not going to plant this. Or, you know, if they're probably not going to eat it. Um, so, you know, it's probably okay. And in the case of, of clematis, it, it is one of those, they might throw up kind of situations. So not deathly toxic, but a number of plants in the ranunculaceae, the family that clematis is in, are known to be toxic. And I think it's also important that, you know, short of a plant being sold as an edible plant, you shouldn't be eating you or your pets should not be eating them. So, um, but this is definitely a place where a little research will go a long way and help you feel more confident in your planting decisions. That's great advice, Stacy. Uh, Donald uh, writes to us, I love cat mint and Russian sage. Some of the new cultivars like cat's pajamas, nepeta and denim, which is the Russian sage, love that plant, um, are not as easy and vigorous growers in my garden. Could it be that pH needs are different for these 
cultivars. And Stacy, I would not go down the pH road. I don't think it's a factor. It's it's like uh, other plants, you know, the, the cat's pajamas, uh, cat's meow that I grow in my landscape. I love the fact that it seems to have much more controlled growth than, let's say, you know, the older standby varieties like Walker's Low. Right. You know, that's a great point. Yeah, it's this is probably not any kind of cultural condition. If you're seeing really vigorous growth from those old-fashioned varieties like Walker's Low or uh, the standard Russian sage, Uh, It's important to understand that when people, when plant breeders develop a new variety, they're usually looking to solve some sort of problem. And that's exactly what Rick was saying. Like uh, Porovskia, Russian sage, can get to be a huge plant and it almost always flops. You know, so what will happen by the time it starts to flower, it gets really heavy and it, it, some people will call it splaying, where it kind of just opens up from the center. So it doesn't really flop down like a, you know, peony does, but it just kind of breaks open and falls all over the place. That's what that autumn joy sedum yes, will do. Yes, will splay, yeah. Right. And so the breeder's goal was to eliminate this splaying. And one of the ways they do that is by working with the plant's growth, uh, making it a more compact variety And as such, it's not going to grow as quickly. It's not going to have long inner nodes where it's just, you know, shooting out really, you know, fast growth that can often be weak and floppy. So I think in both of these cases, and definitely with uh, the Porovsky or Russian sage, it's just a situation where the breeding goal was not to have a super fast growing, super vigorous plant, but to have one that doesn't flop and doesn't splay and stays well behaved, like you said, Rick. Um, So it's kind of uh, remedying some of the life abilities of the older varieties. My parents always taught me I have to behave on the splay ground from a young age, right? Plants need to do uh, the same. And again, you'll find with herbaceous perennials that in some cases to avoid those problems, uh, dividing the plants from time to time really is of benefit. Dividing and pinching. And pinching. And, you know, pinching, uh, I think pinching perennials is such, I don't do it, but I I think it's a, a fascinating topic. And if anybody is interested in controlling their perennial growth, I would highly, highly recommend the book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden by Tracy DeSabato Oust. This, uh, yes. she spent years of her life pinching back her garden at different times, taking meticulous observations of when things bloomed, how the pruning affected them. Does pruning it or, or uh, pinching it at this time do this? Does it do that? And she uh, published all of her results in that book. And, uh, you know, there's very few gardening books that I would say are a must own. But if you are a perennial gardener, I think that is an absolute essential item to your library. I love it. I just made a note. Future show, we're going to talk about pinching. Pinching. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. We'll have to do it soon. It's almost time to pinch. Yes, that's true. (laughs) A pinch to grow an inch. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break now. If you have a gardening question for us, you can email us at help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And when we come back, we've got branching news and you won't want to miss it. So please stay tuned to Gardening Simplified. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. It's time for branching news. And our first item in branching news this week is a slugfest. That's right. Oregon Oregon State University recent research reveals bread dough to be the best attractant for trapping slugs even better than beer. Now, this is interesting, Stacy. Uh, the collaborators haven't determined yet why bread dough, a simple mixture of flour, water, and yeast, attracts slugs and snails, but they theorize that it's the fermentation process, process that draws them. And I would agree, it's got to be the yeast. It's the yeast you could do uh, to uh, to trap slugs, but pretty interesting stuff. It is interesting. And, you know, in the, in the relatively short time we've had this show, I can't believe how many people have written to us with slug questions and slug problems. And they almost always say, I I don't want to use anything toxic. If I can help it, I want something non-toxic. And this is a great opportunity. So the recipe that these researchers at Oregon State developed is one cup flour, two cups of water or as needed, and one packet of yeast. And don't worry, we'll put this in the show notes. So if you're driving, you don't need to slam on the brakes and write down the recipe. (laughs) Just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. You mix that together. You put it in a container like a cottage cheese container or yogurt container. You bury it with the rim flush with the soil level. And then the next morning, you go out and clean out your slug, stir up your dough, and start it again. Wow. You just let them slug it out. It's amazing. Yeah, they went bonkers for it. Uh, According to the university, bread dough outperformed everything. In one instance, over 18,000 snails were trapped 
in 48 hours. Wow. So very effective wow. and uh, non-toxic, although you aren't going to want to let your dog get a hold of that because, you know, yikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Slugs have given us a lesson on bread dough. If you just loaf around your toast, right? So this works. I'm going to give this a try in my garden. So how about good vibes? Always talking about good vibes in the space that you're in. And we as gardeners, landscapers, garden centers, plant lovers, we like to think about good vibes in your space. We're going to share with you a uh, study that uh, basically talked about the top 10 essentials for good vibes wherever you are. Maybe mm -hmm. a restaurant, visiting someone's home, your home, where, wherever it may be, your space. Cleanliness was at the top of the list. Windows was high on the list also. And good smells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Trendy design, high ceilings, but plants or green space also made that top 10 list. And I think that that's good because the top five indicators of bad vibes in a space are unpleasant smells, dirty environment, too cold or too hot, no windows, and dead or unkempt plants and Oof. greenery. Oh, well, that, uh, that makes a garden a very questionable. You don't know if it's good vibes or bad. It might have bad smells. It could have too hot or too cold temperatures. But to me, the garden always has good vibes. It's great. The other day I was out and about. I saw this young man. He was walking along. He was wearing a T-shirt. And it said, don't kale my vibe. I thought that was good. <laughs> I want one of those shirts. Did you stop to tell him how much you appreciated I it? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Put a surprised. smile on his face. <laughs> Okay, word of the day. Uh, as I've always said on this program, uh, Stacy, I find you to just be a genius uh, with words and pronunciation of words and all of that stuff. And I have to be honest with you, I did not know this word, flavido. Flavido. Flu fluvial? Fluvi it's a hard one fluvido. to pronounce. Flavido, yeah. yeah. Relating to rivers? Or uh, no. P, uh, this is, uh, it refers to the, this was in the Merriam-Webster word of the day, and it says, it refers to the colored outer layer of the rind of a citrus fruit. Oh, I'm I've like, never I've heard that I've never either. heard that before. That's, uh, that's interesting. Yep, so. that's a new one on me for sure. Hmm, okay. Well, I don't know how many times people would have occasion to use it. Exactly. But. I've never... <laughs> found the occasion you know and that's it. kind of one of those things when we say like oh it doesn't matter if you pronounce a scientific name correctly as long as you get the plant that you want if you're using this word and people have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> it's not really doing you a lot of good either so <laughs> i don't even know how to pronounce it but it's spelled f-l-a-v-e-d-o and according to the merriam-webster dic uh, dictionary yes colored outer layer of the rind of a citrus uh, fruit. So, okay. I don't know. Learned a new word. Interesting. All right. That gets my peel of approval. Uh, let's go to Pennsylvania. According to WTAG, Joshua Jenkins, 42 years old. About, I put this one in here for you, Stacy, because I know you like spiders, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, WTAG. Jay in Pennsylvania, Joshua Jenkins of Altoona, Pennsylvania, was arrested Thursday night after he called 911 because his house was on fire. He was trying to burn spiders. Oh, no. Yeah. And uh, he was, uh, he told them he was using a butane torch. Uh, they said actually he was using a propane torch to burn the spiders and their nests from the outside of the home and uh, started the house on fire not a good idea no that's terrible yeah. there's better why do you like spiders why do i like them yeah. um oh they're just fascinating mm -hmm. i mean i could go on and on about the facts about spider silk but i'll give you one of my favorites did you know that if there if you could make a, a rod of spider silk the thickness of a pencil mm -hmm. and stretch it across the sky so it was taut it would stop a plane in mid-flight that's no how strong way. and elastic it is. Yeah. So it doesn't break. You know, that's why like bugs and stuff can fly into it and they don't fly through. They don't bounce back. They get caught in it. I mean, it really is one of the most amazing materials on earth. And they're just fascinating. I love to watch the orb weavers, which are the kind that make the, you know, really the, the classic spider web shape. I just love to watch them do their work. And um, I love to, you know, watch them catch pest insects and, they're just really cool. Yeah, it's fascinating. It really is. And I love the modern uh, spiders because they don't have webs. They have websites. 
is what they have. They all work as web designers, right? They're techie. They're web <laughs> designers. <laughs> Do you use the relocate method? I am a person who does that. If I find a spider in the house, I uh, I pick it up and take it outside. I do, I do not use the relocate method. I leave the spiders where they are because a lot of people don't realize that there are indoor spiders and there are outdoor spiders. So the indoor spiders are not really going to survive outside. I mean, occasionally an outdoor spider will make its way into your house. But for the most part, your indoor spiders are your indoor spiders and your outdoor spiders are your outdoor spiders. So uh, your indoor spiders are probably not going to be long for the world, but they can fend it for fend for themselves. And you know, hey, you've done the best that you can with something you're comfortable with. So I got to do this. I've got a knock knock joke. Okay. <laughs> okay. Knock 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 knock. Well, you had to count on eight fingers. So who's there? Spider. Exactly. <laughs> All right, a Dutch startup company is now selling coffins that biodegrade within 45 days of burial. Now, that's interesting. The company's Loop Biotech started in 2020 and uh, makes coffins and urns. They're shipping to Europe and the United States. Uh, and so they're making these coffins, let's see, uh, upcycled hemp combined with mycelium, the root structure of mushrooms, and uh, they make these coffins, and they start uh, breaking down after 45 days. That's, now, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a good solution. Yeah, fascinating. And hopefully they're much more affordable. <laughs> well, yeah, their marketing campaign should be uh, buy our coffin. It's the last thing you'll ever need. There you go. Right? Yeah. So You're hired. <laughs> Let's go to Charlotte. Charlotte, North Carolina, the city of Charlotte. They have a new bike lane, electric street, street, boy, that's tough even for me, a trained professional to say, street sweeper, uh, they named it. The Charlotte Department of Transportation asked the public to submit ideas for what they should call this street sweeper. The public weighed in on what to call it, and they settled on sweepy McSweep face. Oh, boy. That Inspired by Bodie boat. McBoatface? Yes. I thought the uh, the runner ups were better, uh, Cleopatra and Sweep Caroline. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean especially since it's Carolina, North Carolina. I'm surprised that didn't win. Yeah, I guess they just wanted to make the news with another Bodie McBoatface inspired name. I think so too. And their streets will bristle with beauty. Stacy, always fun to do this show with you. There you have it, another edition of Branching News. And in upcoming weeks, boy, we've got some great topics to share with you and always invite you to visit our website. Our website is gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. There are a number of people who work to post show notes there for you, pictures. And, of course, we thank Adriana Robinson for the fabulous job that she does engineering, producing the show, getting this content out there for you, folks. We thank her. And, uh, Stacy, it's fun. And we just want people to visit the website and send us your questions or comments. Too. Yes. And if you are watching us on YouTube and seeing Adriana's work, you're also seeing that we have our new summer background up. Because it's June, so you won't want to miss your opportunity to check that out. We've changed with the seasons, and uh, it's full-on gardening season, so we, we couldn't be happier. Fantastic. It's a kick in the plants. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Adriana. And thanks to you for watching and listening to the Gardening Simplified Show.